When I was eight years old, I experienced my first major ecological catastrophe. The spot that I hung out in as a kid with my friends was graded down to dirt, terraced, and paved over to be turned into a housing development by excavators. The whole landscape had completely changed and I went home in a fit of rage. I tore the poster that was on my wall. It was SimCity. It was this poster that showed this Nintendo game where you build cities. I ripped it off of the wall and I left up the poster of Rampage, which is, was this game where you play the role of Godzilla or King Kong and you destroy cities. I left it, left it up and I, I vowed as an eight-year-old to fight development. Yet here I am sitting in one of those machines. And I think it's because I believe that right now we have to leverage all the energy and resources we can towards the regeneration of the planet and the restoration of landscapes. In our area, rainfall has decreased by about 50% in recent years. And at the same time, rainfall intensity has increased by about 200%. One of the effects of decreased rainfall and increased storm intensity is that when the rain does fall, it doesn't necessarily penetrate into the heavy clay soils that are prevalent in this area, and it can actually sheet across the land and run off without actually percolating deep into the soil and nurturing the roots of the trees. These climate-driven factors overlap with land use practices that by design or consequence have led to the rapid movement of water out of watersheds. So this includes modern plantation forestry, roads, diversions, and it includes historic practices like the trapping of the beaver, water diversions for mining, and log drafts. All of these practices have compounded on each other to lead to a situation where water is extremely in deficit in the landscape. When I arrived in this valley 15 years ago, the creek would be dry by about mid-July. Old timers remember the creek flowing year round. And over the last couple years, after most of the upland forest in this basin was logged, the creek is dry by about the 1st of June. We're seeing the trees die, we're seeing the creeks dry, and we're watching climate change occur in real time. Upstream of this land is pretty much private timberland, and that land is managed as a clear-cut based monoculture Douglas fir plantation. And that's the style of forest management practices that are mostly found throughout Western Oregon and elsewhere. And there's actually research coming out of various universities in Oregon and elsewhere that's showing a direct correlation between reduced stream flows and clear-cut based forestry practices. That style of forestry is based on coming in and cutting the harvestable timber and leaving an exposed landscape which is hotter and drier than surrounding shaded forest areas. Another factor that recent research has found is that those rapidly growing trees after a certain time period actually increase the amount of evapotranspiration, that's the water that the trees are taking up out of the soil and releasing into the atmosphere. As they're between 20 and 40 years old, that evapotranspiration rate really increases rapidly compared to older trees. So when we have this plantation style forestry where the trees are actually harvested around 40 years of age, we're seeing that there's actually uh, more water leaving the landscape uh, during that active growth period of those trees than if those trees were left to grow uh, longer and older. So that's one of the factors that we feel like is contributing to reduced stream flows in our area and one of the reasons that we felt really strongly about placing this pond and other earthworks here on the property with the hope being that eventually we could help augment those stream flows and keep water around in the landscape longer.
Earthworks are one way that we can reverse this loss of water from watersheds. Through soil's capacity to wick and hold immense amounts of water, as well as ponds' ability to retain that water longer and pressurize the water so that it sinks into deeper soil layers, we get a widening of the lens of water in the soil and an increased ability for that water to do beneficial work in the landscape. The lens created by a pond increases plant growth and through that increases carbon capture. Increased water availability leads to more water for wildlife. It leads to springs re-emerging and ultimately at the landscape scale builds on itself to increase the base flow of streams and can return them to year-round flow. This pond was done as an education project in order to empower people to understand how, when, and why to build these ponds. First, we'll remove all the topsoil, all the organic soil, and set it aside, and we'll get down to the subsoil. Everybody really has the ability to do this. One can place logs and branches as check dams by hand, and that type of work can restore the floodplain, reconnect the waterways to the historic floodplain channels and return a creek to year round flow without even bringing in a big machine. Siting a pond is certainly one of the most important aspects of a pond project. What you're wanting to look for is the location of the pond in relationship to what it's irrigating, what it's supplying. You're wanting to locate it as high as possible in the landscape while also situating it so that it can catch as much water as possible from upland sources. I think you need to go up, like... Because you're under the bubble. You're almost placing the pond at the highest low point. Technically speaking, that's considered the key point. The key point is the place where the land goes from being steep to flat. When you look at it from a topographic map, what you see is that all of the water flows perpendicular to contour and concentrates in this point. So we've identified the key point. We've also found through digging test pits that the soil is adequate for holding water. We dug a pit in August and that pit filled up with water in three days. That was a very dry time of year here in Oregon. But also digging as deep as we could go with a bucket and then cutting out a slope that was safe so that nothing could get stuck in it we saw that the soil type was adequate for building a pond. Ideally, what you have is a porous surface layer that transitions into a highly impermeable subsurface layer that can create a permanent seal on your water and the water will percolate in and run on that. What this reveals is Really, I mean, just an ideal situation. This would be the A horizon of the soil, and this is a, a dark, silty clay loam. It's gonna have a little bit more, more um, sand and organic material in it. And then below that, it kind of transitions into this lighter, silty clay loam to almost pure clay. I mean, this is like ceramic. And then this horizon, transitions into this more kind of like rocky clay, which is essentially a mix of clay and fractured bedrock. And then it gets to pure bedrock. And I'm standing, you can see that there's a little bit of flow and that's running right on the surface of the bedrock here. So what, what we're primarily going to want to work with is this clay material. And this is going to form the interior core of our dam. And it's also going to be used to create a seal along the dam and the, um, the bottom of the pond so that as water emanates in from, from upslope and, and out of uh, porous layers, it'll encounter this and just have a complete seal. So the next step was preparing the site. We surveyed where the ultimate water level would be, where we suspected the dam height would be, and what the width of the pond would be. Should really invent a laser level that, instead of beeping like that, makes bird calls or something. 
And also we surveyed the plants that were existing within the footprint of the pond. So making sure that we weren't gonna be impacting any rare threatened species. There's this nice monkey flower in here that I'd really like to dig up. We cleared the shrubs and the brush. The next step was deciding which trees specifically we were gonna take out. So it's definitely got beetle pressure in it. I mean, you can see in the cambium how much the yeah, to it. it's totally starting to girdle it already. But you know, this is probably an 80 year old tree. It's under attack already. Leaning into the pond Leaning side. Leaning into the pond. In 25 years, like you don't want anything that's gonna threaten the damn wall that could breach it or something like that. That top is really leaning out, isn't it? It yeah. must just have a couple of branches hung up. Yeah, we don't want to leave that very long. stage them for on-site milling and processing. And the next step after that was to clear the topsoil. So this topsoil is special and at the end of the project, we drive back across the dam and we scoop the topsoil back up and spread it over the top of the dam. And what that does then is it creates a good substrate for new grass and other herbaceous vegetation to establish on top of the dam. We spread it around the back side of the pond as well. The next step is to trench out the area where the key goes. So the key is a cut trench in the middle of the location of the dam. You dig that out down below the excavation pit level and we began to construct our dam by placing a wall of extremely high clay content soil into the center of the dam. And we build that key up until we get above the elevation of water level. Here, we have the benefit of having a lot of clay content. And it's said that if you have more than 40% clay, you can build an earthen dam that holds and also retains water. And I built this up until I was above the ultimate water height by about three feet. The dam over time will settle a bit. I'm anticipating that probably the dam will come down to about two feet above the water height. At about every foot of added soil to the dam, we track rolled the dam with the excavator a number of times in order to compact it as well as possible. This dam was built so that it was wide enough to be able to accommodate vehicle traffic over it from the key line road, but all dams don't necessarily have to be this wide. What I did then is I cut a spillway through one side that would set the ultimate water height below the ultimate height of the dam. The spillway is built to be able to handle three times at least the maximum anticipated water flow coming through the channel. And into the side of the dam near the spillway, we placed a trickle tube. It is set just below the height of the spillway. And it takes the subtle flow during the non-rainy season and diverts it to a pipe which runs out and around the side of the dam so that the earthen spillway doesn't take a small flow of water year round because that flow can slowly cut away at the spillway. It might seem a little technical, but it's not very glamorous. You really just scoop in place and scoop in place for days until it's done. <laughs> a lot of dirt. Once the pond was complete, it took about four or five months to fill completely. 
and we were coming up here every few days to check on its progress as it moved inch by inch with every passing rainstorm. Over the years, we've dug a series of ponds and other earthworks on the property, which have served to help harvest and maintain the water on the site throughout the year. This pond here is kind of the capstone of that earthworks project, and it serves to feed into all of the ponds lower on the property. When we began, this particular valley would have very little water moving through it. Watching these ponds, I'm seeing that they are rehydrating the landscape. I'm seeing the water flowing over land longer into the dry season. When I'm walking in the woods, I'm seeing that the vegetation is green downhill of the ponds. And we're not needing to irrigate our orchards and our forest gardens. So this type of water harvesting earthwork is one that does retain water, but slowly releases it through the soil to the surrounding environment. And so we have both a balance of meeting human needs and providing benefit to the ecology. Too often the focus in pond development and pond permitting is this idea in regards to human use that it's a degenerative force, and too often it is. But there's a right way to do something that can lead to beneficial socio-economic outcomes at the same time are assistive and regenerative to the environment and also us who are part of it. It's my hope in demonstrating this work that we can further the idea that developing these ponds is something that should be encouraged and promoted by local divisions of government and regulatory agencies. One of the reasons we are really excited about this pond is that we feel like it's a really good example for local landowners and land stewards to potentially replicate on their sites as a means to enhance biodiversity and overall watershed health. I think about what this could look like at the watershed scale. This is a 40-acre property in the midst of a 400-acre watershed basin. We could do this work on every tributary within this basin, there's at least 10. So we could have easily 100 of these ponds scattered throughout this basin contributing water to the stream channel. You could only imagine what this would do for wildlife and for the biological potential of the forests in this watershed. Particularly if you coupled this with other practices like placing check dams in the incised channels to re return the flow to its easily 100-foot wide floodplain, or if you were to increase the width and the diversity of the streamside forests, not to mention returning forests to mixed species, mixed age stands, I'm sure that we could see a return of the creek to year-round flow. This is just a tributary creek of a sub-watershed of a sub-watershed of the Willamette Valley. You can really imagine how all of these minor tributaries contributing to the Willamette Valley itself, this work can rapidly restore the hydrology of watersheds.